All right, on your mark and set. Cognitive dissonance is one of the kind of pillars of social psychology. I like it, and I think you're going to like it, and you're going to see a lot of yourself in this. This is so universal, and, and it's so universal it's almost hard to describe because it can apply to so many situations. Well, we know cognitive means thought, and we know dissonance is the opposite of harmony. So obviously we're going to have a conflict. Now a conflict what? Maybe when there's two conflicting thoughts, or a conflicting thought and an action. Maybe you did something, but you knew it was wrong. We kind of call that guilt. This causes extreme discomfort. So in your margin, when you're writing down the definition of cognitive dissonance and you're dutifully ignoring me and writing down everything on the screen, I want you to actually write down in your margin, cognitive dissonance is bad. You don't want it. You want to avoid it. And you will do all sorts of like uh, mental yoga transformations to bend your logic so you don't have your mind stuck between two things. I think we wrote down, and I still haven't had anyone kind of successfully, un successfully challenge me. I think we wrote down the idea that you can't do anything for long and hate it. Did you write that down? Yeah. Has anyone come up with a good thing you... Go ahead, please. Empty the dishwasher. Empty in the dishwasher. You cannot do it for long and hate it. Is that what you, so you're saying you've done it? I'm suggesting you haven't done it enough. If that were your job, and you did that, if you do it long enough, you will come to value it. See, you can't change what you have to do. You can't change work. You can't change the fact you have to do homework. But you can change how you feel about it. And if you can't change how you feel about it, you'll stop doing it. You will do almost anything. Now, maybe, just maybe, you're looking at me suspicious, like, no, I hate unloading the dishwasher. I will always hate unloading the dishwasher. When I have my own screaming little brats, <laughs> I'm going to hate unloading the dishwasher. Maybe, just maybe, you will find an exception. But remember what I said. Social psychology is about most people in most situations. You can't do something for long and hate it. Do your parents hate their jobs? Mm. Most of them don't. I know that if you listen to country music, you're going to say, yeah. <laughs> the reality is... The reality is most people, except for me, hate their, uh, like their jobs. That was a 40 inch slip. The reality <laughs> is this. Um, you can't do something for long and hate it. If you hate your job, you either quit or you'll stop hating it. This is extremely powerful. If you look at the Marine Corps, and I, I don't imagine you cannot, any, there's anyone who can't respect the Marine Corps. If you, if you look at the Marine Corps, one of the things I find amazing is I have never, ever, ever, ever found a Marine who considers themselves a former Marine. Everyone who's ever been through uh, uh, basic training, indoctrination, boot camp, anyone who's ever been through it, liked it. Now they didn't like it at the time. This is why I dare you to find a Marine. I dare you to find a Marine who says, God, I wish I never became a Marine. I wish I never joined the Marine Corps. That was a waste of time. No. But that's powerful because let's think about it. Some kid steps off the bus, First day of boot camp, yelled at, screamed at, 10-mile runs, push-ups. You don't like it? Here's another 10-mile run. You don't want it? Here's even more push-ups. I know that drill instructors are not supposed to physically discipline while hitting and punching, but I promise you that happens. So if you were to look at what happens when you take an average person and turn them to a Marine, it's not pleasant. Why then don't people hate it? because you can't do something for long and hate it. I guarantee many of your coaches make you run. They make you maybe do punishment exercises and you hate conditioning. You hate it, hate it, hate it. Why don't you quit? Can you? In fact, I'm willing to bet that as the season goes through, you'll start to respect your coach even more. And if you graduate, if you do well, and the next group of students come in, and they're the next varsity or junior varsity or whatever, and your coach goes real easy on them, you'll be like, ah, that's not fair. As much as you hate the discipline, you'll come to respect it. This is a powerful concept. I do this every day in my class. Can I see your notebook? Do you like your notes? Stop. This is bizarre. How many of y'all like taking notes? Oh, let the record show cameras <laughs> that we have quite a few nerds like, I do, I'm Hermione. All right then, so the reality is this. You like taking notes, so you're telling me. You can home like, Mom, I just need a catalog. I got a copy. 
No, I don't think you do. <laughs> You're telling me for like Christmas or Hanukkah or Kwanzaa or freaking Festivus or whatever you celebrate. If you don't know Festivus, I urge you to watch Seinfeld. So you're saying, hey, Mom, can you please just give me a chalkboard? Because I want a copy. No, you don't. So you're telling me you like taking notes. Or is it the fact you've done it so long, you have to appreciate it? This is powerful. We're going to dig into this a little bit deeper. Let's look at this. The person you know is named Leon Festinger. I don't want you to copy every word. In fact, all I want you to do is copy one of the studies, one of the uh, research efforts he's known for, called the Boring Test, right down Festinger. And you read, you put this in your own words. What he did was he made people do something unpleasant. And then he made them try to convince other people it wasn't unpleasant. And if you say something, if you try to convince someone that's doing it, you cannot do something and hate it. So if you try to convince someone that the task wasn't boring, you'll start to believe it, even though the task was boring. But you can't do something and hate it. So one thing's got to change. You can't change the fact you did it, but you can change how you think about it. Let's go through this a little bit deeper. Let's dig in and find some examples. Buying something versus saving money. Now, we talked about it. No one ever wants to give up a crisp $100 bill. Saturday mornings, I go to Nordstrom. All right, now, sometimes, because I'm a freak, I wear a white lab coat, and I got a clipboard. And there ain't nothing scarier than someone with a white lab coat and clipboard. You might think a clown with an ax, that's scary. Oh, no. <laughs> You've never seen anyone with a white lab coat and a clipboard. I dare you to go to your mom. She's in the freaking hut, cooking up hamburger helper, about to pour it in a trough, a trough for you and your family to scarf it up. So while your mom is cooking at the kitchen, have a clipboard? Mm -hmm. She's like, oh, honey, what are you doing? Is this a school project? Subject is curious. <laughs> <laughs> honey, what are you doing? I'm uncomfortable with this. Subject shows some unease. Why wouldn't you do it to our principal? <laughs> Can we actually? I would love that. You're not breaking all. Do not do it to police officers. <laughs> not very good. Well, why would you not break social rules? Okay, so here you go. You know I'm a freak, and social psychology is all about breaking rules roles and rules, social rules, not legal rules, social rules. So I go in real, real early morning. If you look at, you know, those big fancy department stores, they have the huge circular racks. And you know what I do? I get in. I hide in there like a fort. All right then. Now some of you are like this, let me ask you this. How many of you all have never been inside a big rack and played like fort games in there? You don't know what you're missing. Are you curious now? No, she was doing push-ups. Right. All right. So here's what I do. I'm sitting there Saturday morning. I got my clipboard, and I'm just watching people shop. It's a little creepy because I'm like, you know, peeking through the stuff. And then I see some lady, and she, she gets a shirt, and she's like stuck. She doesn't know if she wants the shirts. Now, some people are going to say, I see her gears turning. Uh-uh-uh-uh. I'm going to try to make a joke between when you see someone's gears turning, you like to think they're thinking. And what's another word for thinking? Cognition. So gears and cogs. Whenever someone's actually trying to buy a shirt, they're not, they're not thinking. They're feeling. Oftentimes it's fear. Should I buy it? Should I not? I'm afraid of losing my money, but I'm afraid of not buying the shirt. Do I really want it? Is it jealousy? So I'm waiting. I'm not waiting for them to make a decision. I'm waiting them to d figure out their feeling. And once they do the behavior and they make a move to the checkout aisle, or they decide to put it back in, they just put their thing right on, the, right before the hanger even hits the rack, I burst out like freaking Aragorn coming out of the doors. If you know what I'm talking about, you're a dork. So my point is simply this. And so we go, ah! And I'm like, excuse me, can I ask you some questions? <laughs> Why'd you decide to buy the shirt? And that woman's like, uh, 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 now notice. She had no cognitive, well thought out reasons before. She was acting clearly on emotion. So I say to her, why'd you buy? She goes, well, it's uh, made out of cotton, but I won't shrink. It's made in America. It'll go with everything. I can return it if I want. I can use it in summer and winter. She's gonna come up with a bunch of reasons that she never crossed her mind because she wasn't engaged in her mind when she was making the decision. So how does this relate to cognitive dissonance? Once she makes a decision, she cannot then say, oh, you're right, I shouldn't buy the shirt. 
Admitting you're wrong is extremely painful. I never, ever admit I'm wrong. It's lucky for me because I've never actually been wrong. I thought I made a mistake once, but I was wrong. But no, I didn't. Anyway, you'll get that. That's kind of confusing. My point to you is simply this. Have you ever been in an argument and you were losing? You knew you were wrong, but you just make crap up to keep going. Yeah, you do, don't you? And if you don't, what's wrong with you? So my point is this. Once you do something, you won't go back and admit you were wrong. So once you do something, you decide if this is, I mean, saying something is a behavior. Once you do a behavior, you will make sure your thoughts agree. You will make crap up to agree with what you already did or already said. Because if you have that conflict, we call that cognitive dissonance. And it's painful. Most people, once they buy something, they will find a reason why what they did was a good idea. You don't believe me? Let's dig in a little deeper. Let's think about a soldier shooting someone. And you're like, oh, where'd that come from? I'm suggesting nobody can look down the barrel of a rifle and say, right as you're about to squeeze the trigger, I said squeeze, not pull, for my NRA friends. Right as you're about to squeeze the trigger, no one's like, oh my God, I'm going to make some more orphans. That person about to shoot, it's a father just like me. I bet they have kids. I bet they have a wife. I'm going to make a lot of people cry. That person, I hope they're going to feel a lot of pain. Nobody can do that. You can't bully someone and think of them as a human, as a person. They're one of them. They're the out group. They're a terrorist. If you can hurt someone who's just like you, you've got some serious problems. Let's talk about this. Now, we will get into a different unit, the intelligence unit, the cognitive unit. How many of y'all want to take an IQ test? Okay, then. I bet, and here's why. I'm willing to bet that on some level you think an IQ test or the score is valid. Now, let's be careful because to take an IQ test is cost money. It costs time. It's not like a little quiz you take in the back of Ranger Rick or Seventeen Magazine. Is he the one for you? Check. My, my point is... Why would I say that? My point is simply this. My point is that if you were to take an IQ test, you're going to pay money, you're going to spend time, and you remember what it's, if, you, if you've taken a standardized test, the SAT, afterwards, you're fried. After hours and hours of concentrating, you walk out and you just need a nap. It's tough. So you're going to spend time, you're going to spend money, you're going to spend effort. You think an IQ test matters. It's worth something. Otherwise, you wouldn't do it. So then you get the results back. I got bad news. Half of you will be below average. By definition, not everyone can be above average. That's some scary stuff. So you get an IQ test back, you get an IQ back, and it's like Forrest Gump. Forrest is right here. Now my point is going to be, are you going to be like, holy crap, I should stop being, I, you know what, my dreams are wrong. Let me ratchet it down a little bit. I'm going to be a high school teacher. <laughs> my point is simply this. Are you going to accept that? You've got a couple choices. Either accept the results are valid, reject your dreams, keep your dreams, and reject the test. Or are you going to rewrite history in your own mind and say, you know what, I just took it as a joke. I knew the test didn't matter. You, will change, you can't change the fact you took the test, and you can't change the test score, but you will change how you think of the test. You'll say, ah, you know what, I don't agree. Those tests are biased. They're crap. I was sick that day. I wasn't even trying. We, we do these mental gymnastics to prevent cognitive dissonance because cognitive dissonance is painful. Every single one of you know that binge drinking is bad. If I gave you an essay, you probably, you know, you could tell me why it's bad. Bad for every kind of bodily system. But most people your age do it, statistically, and do it fairly often. We'll get into why later. But I don't think any one of you all can do it. And think about how bad it's going to be. You can't be token up. You can't be taking a big breath and holding it deep inside. You can't be pounding a cup of whatever cheap beer you can afford and be like, oh, shouldn't be doing this. Man, God's really mad at me. There goes another brain cell. You can't be doing that. So if you can't change the behavior, you stop thinking it's bad. And I suggest most people your age have come to the conclusion, well, drinking's not that bad, as long as you keep it under control. But by definition, binge drink is not out of control. Do you see the illogic? Let's go one more. Maybe you're like, God, stop giving me the anti-drinking speech. All right, let's get a little naughty, a little saucy, if you will. Let's talk about sexual behavior. Let's hope we don't cross a line. 
you're whatever you wherever you are with boyfriend or girlfriend and you know what first base got that second base you're round. You're going for third. You got mm -hmm, thoughts are crossing. Not what thoughts. What exactly are the bases? I'm so. <laughs> you know what? I'm not gonna explain. Is the bases? Stop. Nobody ever says if you're doing the bases and you got your hands in places. No one ever says stop. Wait. Let's think. Let's make a chart. <laughs> I double dog dare you. If you're kissing on someone, they're kissing on you, and like, mm, you're old. you know what I'm saying? You're all like that. I double dog dare you. Like, stop. Let's say a prayer. <laughs> because I don't think you can think of religion and other people's no no parts at the same time. I don't think I crossed the line. Did I cross the line a long time ago? Check it out. Other vocabulary words we're going to use. Now, these two vocabulary words come out of the stress unit. They come out of the stress unit. Approach avoidance conflict. And you could argue, and we probably will when we get to the stress unit, that cognitive dissonance is a form of stress. We want to make it go away. The approach avoidance conflict means that we want something, but we don't want it. You want to audition, but you're afraid of rejection. You want to ask the person out, but you're afraid. You want to try, but, but, but. We always have these problems. Now, approach, approach is when you want two things at the same time, but you can only choose one. That's tough. Or maybe you don't want to do something, but you have to make a choice between two bad ones. So while these two terms aren't going to be found in most social psychology units, I like to kind of, for lack of a better word, cross-pollinate, see connections between units. Cognitive dissonance means there is no regret. Once you do something and you feel guilt, do you know how to make the guilt go away? Keep doing it. If you keep doing it, you will stop feeling regret. Notice you're not going to change your behavior, but you change your thoughts. So now we're on persuasion. Like I said, we've done fundamental attribution error, we've done cognitive dissonance, now we're on persuasion, but they do overlap. I'm gonna throw, show this, and many of you like well-trained Pavlovian dogs are gonna start to write, stop. If you know what persuasion is, I would not write down this lengthy stanza. What I would do is read, is there anything in here that you don't know, anything that sticks out? What I would suggest for you is persuasion, and I would maybe write down the idea of maybe social pressure or social influence. That's the important part. And we have to define social and we have to define pressure. So check this out. It also might not involve consciousness. If, the, if you can remember the last thing that you really wanted, you begged your mom and dad for, you saved up, you could not wait to get the phone or the shoes or the shirt, whatever it was, it really wanted it. I want you to ask yourself this. When did you start wanting it? You can't remember. It was like, oh, Thursday, August 6th, I remember wanting this. No. And I don't think you can remember when you first started liking your favorite song. Interestingly enough, some of these social forces and a lot of psychological forces start working on you and you're not, ava you're not aware of it. Notice that a very good advertising campaign is not going to make you buy something you don't want to do. No, that's not what advertising does. Advertising makes you want it, even though you don't know they are slowly changing your mind without you being aware of it. That's persuasion. So let's check this out. Persuasion has a couple parts to it. Okay, before you see all these words and get worried about it, I don't want you to write all that stuff down. Under persuasion, you're going to write number one, and you're going to write source, and you're going to skip two lines. Under persuasion, you've got source. That's number one. Skip two lines. Number two is going to be the nature. Just write nature. The nature of the communication. Right now, we've got number one is source. Skip two lines. Number two, nature. Skip two lines. And number three is going to be audience. And of course, skip two lines. There are a lot of factors. 
that affect persuasion. And I promise you right now, somewhere in the universe, there's a convention in some city of a group of salespeople who are desperately trying to figure out how can we get our customers to not only buy stuff, but to want to buy stuff. That's the powerful thing. And according to cognitive dissonance, very few people will ever buy something and regret the choice. Nobody walks out of a car dealership and says, damn, I hate this thing. No, you walk out thinking you got a great deal. You walk out, here's how sick it is. You walk out happy that you are now in debt. Isn't that a bizarre thing? And oftentimes people are like, thank you for approving my loan, Mr. Car Dealer. You thank him for putting you in thousands of dollars of debt? Isn't that weird? We'll get into how those tricks are. But first, let's talk about the source. We got a lot of stuff to write down. I don't know. I mean, I don't know exactly what to write because I'm clearly not an expert on persuasion. But I will tell you this, one of the first words you need to write down is called credibility. Are your parents a credible source, do you believe, when they try to convince you of something? I see nods. Anyone say no? Mom and dad, they don't know anything. Stupid parents, they've never been where I am. They don't have my best interests at heart. They don't, oh well, yeah, they do. Why would you think your parents aren't good as a good source? If your parents aren't necessarily a good source, a school administrator isn't necessarily a good source, whether it's the dean of students or principal of Schmidlap Elementary School, let me ask you this question. Do, you, do any of you respect your teachers or professors? Some. Why? My dreams died in 2004. All right, so moving on. I know, right? So check this out. On your market set, when we're talking about a source of communication, if I were to give you an anti-smoking speech, or with your health teachers giving an anti-smoking speech, am I a credible source? Not really. What if you have some dude come in who has had lung cancer, or has their larynx removed? Credible source? Yes. What if they got it because of smoking? Oh, clearly. Or would you want to hear from a professional athlete? who is in such perfect shape, and wow, I really respect their physical abilities, and they've never smoked. This is a wild question. Are professional athletes good spokespeople? Who would be someone that's, uh, that is a good thing? I don't know. I will tell you that the last time I went to buy a car from a car dealership, I'm fascinated by car dealerships because they use a lot of psychology. And I'm gonna admit a little bit of something that maybe, just maybe, I acted in a stereotyped way. But before we do it, we gotta have a little thing. I went to go buy a truck. Now, I want all of you all to say truck normally. Everyone say truck. truck. Uh -huh. Now, I want you to say it the redneck way. Truck. Yeah, and you got to make it a syllable and a half. Truck. truck. All right, try it. Everyone go ahead. Truck. Someone didn't try it, did she? <laughs> Let's hear it. You're scared, aren't you? Embrace your inner redneck. Ah, oh, awful. So check it out. I go in to the dealership. All right, I'm ready to do battle, man, because I know that me and this dude, we're going to be fighting over my money. He wants it, I want it. And they're not going to be my friend. And so out pops this, I, you know, again, I'm old, I'm grumpy, I'm mad. So out pops this little girl, she's probably 22, I still call her girl. I think she's like 5'2", maybe 5 foot, weighs 100 pounds, soaking wet. She's got to hold on when the wind blows, or whew, she's gone. So my point is, she's all happy. She's like, hi, sir, can I help you? I'm like, yeah, can I talk to someone about buying a truck? She's like, well, I'll help you with that. I said, I know, but I, I want to talk to a salesperson. I, 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 I can help you. I know that's not right. Do you view some small little thing, female, as a, as a credible source on truck information? No. If you're going to go buy a truck, do you want to talk to some middle old redneck with a freaking belly, coffee breath? You probably do, don't you? If you know the stereotype I'm thinking of. It's not right. Camo. What? Yeah. <laughs> All right, let me ask you this. Go ahead, please. Well, when can I finish talking to the girl with the you That's an interesting question. Would I have the advantage or would she have the advantage? Because I'm assuming she doesn't know. Where she's saying, this guy thinks I'm a dumb little girl. I am going to tear him up. That's an interesting question. If we look at source, if you've ever been homesick, skipping classes, skipping a day of school, and you're sitting there on the couch flipping through channels, every commercial is like a personal injury attorney ad. Have you been injured? You're like, come on, how many people get run over by freaking dump trucks in the world? But anyway, so the point is simply this. Do you have a six-year-old saying, hi, call my daddy. He's a great lawyer. No. Do you have an old lady in a walker trying to tell you that you should call this lawyer? No. no. She's if she's fallen. All right, that's not right. 
But you usually have an old dude, usually white, 50 years old, well fed. All right, he's got a three piece suit, and he's standing in front of a wall of books, holding in the lapels of his suit jacket. And he says, Have you been injured? And he starts walking. That's how every commercial is, because we have an idea of what a credible lawyer is. I don't know how to teach you all what, who is credible, because there's too many variables. Another variable we need to write down is going to be the nature of the communication, how it is said. So sources, who says it? Sources, who says it? Nature, how it is said. Do you want a large, blaring megaphone? Buy now, 100% off. How about this one? Going soon. Prices are temporary. Ooh, now we're putting a little pressure on this. It's interesting to think, do you want someone to tell you logically? Do you want it funny? Do you want it sad? Do you want it to make you angry so you get up and vote and do something? This is a wild question. Now, the reason I went from one to two, believe it or not, is I shouldn't have them in hierarchical order. I should have had you make a triangle and a diagram because number two influences one and number one influences two. You might have the source, who says it, but how they say it makes a difference, how they say it. Look, some people, your parents, if your parents are like, no, don't be sicing it. Like, Mom, no, stop using slang. <laughs> have you ever had your parents try to be cool? It doesn't work. We talk about the nature of the communication. One of the things is, how is it going to be said? Do you want to hear about insurance from someone who knows what they're talking about? Or do you want it from a little cartoon lizard? Cartoon lizard. Is that because you guys are young and you don't know the importance of insurance? You're a little pig, you make boots and pants and boots and pants. Like, oh, the pig. Or do you like the guy that's called Mayhem, you know, dressed in a black suit and says, and he kind of pretends like he's a natural disaster? <laughs> insurance is boring. So, you know what, they've got to make the message funny. But the message can't be funny if it comes from someone who's not funny. So they invent a character. You've got to have source and you've got to have nature kind of merge. When you look at the nature of the communication, how it's said, you have homework. For the next 24 hours, I double dog dare you to not listen to your radio station, not use your favorite Pandora stations. If you listen to rock, go to R&B. R&B, country. If you go to classical, go to rock, rock, you, get, you mix it up. It's like, I'd never do that. Because I want you to listen to that station long enough until you hear a McDonald's advertisement. And if you're going to listen to, if you're listening to rock with the, the primarily young men, it's going to say, extreme sandwich. Rock that Big Mac. But if you're listening to like light jazz and you're like a soccer mom and you're stressed because you can't get all your kids to practices, the message is going to say something like, McDonald's is there for you. You're a busy mom. And in five minutes and less than $18, you can feed your whole family, keep them happy, and be on your way. And all the moms are like, yeah. <laughs> Why don't you, underneath the nature of communication, I want you to write the word demographics. Demographics is roughly translated measure or picture of people. Demo being people, and of course, graph means to measure or picture of. So we got to know not only who's speaking, but who is going to be listening and how should you tailor that question so far. Let's look at this. Again, I said football. I love football. I got like eight TVs and I walk around and my wife sometimes turns the channel, but she doesn't know that I have like hidden remotes. Now, if you had a remote and you had a holster, are you going to draw your remote this way? Or are you going to cross draw? Which way is cooler? Cross. How about a double cross draw? All right, I'm not there yet. I have been training, and soon I will earn my behind-the-back remote holster. How cool would that be to come like that? Wife's like, we should change that. God. All right, my point is this. When I'm watching football and I see a truck ad, you tell me you now have homework. Prove me wrong. I want you to find me a truck ad that does not, in the 30 second of the advertisement, have the truck front wheel going through a mud puddle. Why? How many, how many of y'all have a four-wheel drive vehicle in your house? Not in your house, you know what I'm saying. Have any of you ever used four-wheel drive? R regularly? Like, oh, there's a bunny, get it? No, you don't do that? <laughs> All right, because that's not right. My point to you. What? What did you just say? My point to you? No, you're just talking about bunny, is that what I heard? Yes. 
I call my car a hair remover. Some of you will get that joke. Number three is going to be audience. And maybe we should have put demographics under audience. But you know what? They all kind of merge together. Who? Should you make an advertisement for teenagers differently than you should for, like, Grandma Moses who's sitting in a wheelchair gumming a banana? I think so. <laughs> Why are you laughing at that? That's not right. Have some respect for your elders. Thank you very much. Education makes a difference. So are you going to advertise in a college town? I dare you. I double dog dare you one more time. If you can, YouTube it. Play an advertisement for a used car dealership. We just heard the one. And then I want you to play the advertisement for your local Mercedes dealership. Mercedes dealership's gonna have classical music, but have you ever heard a Mercedes dealership advertisement? I'm seeing blank faces. Most of you haven't, because you don't listen to the stations where they play. Why won't a Mercedes car dealership try to persuade you? Because it knows you don't have the right education, age, or money. Why is it gonna waste your time? Questions on this? All right, let's pack this up like my nomadic mother. <laughs>